I'm Elisa Parenti, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. President Trump visited a private religious school in Florida today, signaling that his education agenda will focus on school choice. He began the tour of St. Andrew Catholic School in Orlando with a visit to a fourth grade classroom. Teachers unions criticized the visit, saying it shows Trump's hostility toward public schools. Federal authorities have arrested a man in connection with threats made to at least eight Jewish community centers nationwide and the Anti-Defamation League's headquarters in New York City. Juan Thompson is accused of making the threats to harass an ex-girlfriend. He appeared in federal court in Missouri today. Attorney General Jeff Sessions met with the head of the NAACP today. That's after Sessions suggested the Justice Department would limit federal investigations of troubled police departments. NAACP leaders say Sessions' policy changes signal a threatening decline in the country's commitment to civil rights. Vice President Mike Pence used his personal email to conduct state business while he was governor of Indiana. And the Indianapolis Star says the account was compromised last year by hackers. An aide says Pence's emails did not deal with classified information. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Technology is next. I'm Caroline Hyde. This is Bloomberg Technology live from New York. Coming up, no risk, no reward. VC firm Lightspeed vaults into Silicon Valley's top tier. That's after being the first to bet on Snap. Our crash course on spotting the big winners with Lightspeed's managing director. Plus, it's her job to make sure tech titans play by the rules. But does the EU really have it in for Apple, Facebook and Google? You'll hear our exclusive interview with EU Competition Commissioner Margaret Vestia. And Autodesk's first report card since the departure of Carl Bass. How did the pivot to the cloud impact the software designer's bottom line? We'll crunch the numbers with the company's interim co-CEOs. First to our lead. Snap continues to pop on the New York Stock Exchange. Shares continue to rise, ending the trading day up 10% over the course of two days. Also riding high on Snap's success in the public market is its investors. Lightspeed Venture Partners was the first institution to financially back the disappearing photo app. The VC has been on a stellar run in recent months with a series of blockbuster sales and IPOs. Very pleased to say joining me now from San Francisco, Lightspeed Venture Partners Managing Director Barry Eggers and founding partner indeed, Barry. And what a story you have to tell on the back of Snap because it was, what, five years ago you were sat in the kitchen and saw your daughter playing with a new app and you had to take a look? That's right, about five years ago today, I walked into my house and walked into the kitchen and my son and my daughter and some of their friends from high school were all looking at their phones and laughing and I was just curious what they were doing. So I asked her, you know, what are you guys doing? And, and my daughter said, hey dad, have you heard about this app? It's called Snapchat. And I said, no, I haven't heard about it. What, what does it do? And she said, well, you know, you, you take pictures, you send them to your friends, and they disappear in 10 seconds or left, less. And I thought, hmm, what kind of pictures? And she said, you know, funny, goofy stuff between friends. And so they showed me a bunch of examples. And it turns out that, you know, they were, they were using this thing about 30 times a day, and all the girls were nodding and saying we use it a lot. And my son said we use it a lot, too. And and we thought, gee, you know, there's this app that all these kids are using and no adults knew about. So we had to investigate. And off went Jeremy Liu, your partner, of course, to Stanford, met the founders within, what was it, a few days, 10 days, the money was in. It started with a 485,000 investment, went up to 8 million or so. The question is, do you think the growth is going to remain in Gen X and your daughter's generation, or will it just grow with that generation, or will indeed it encapsulate a broader age group as it grows? Well, you know, uh, when we invested, I think the company had something like uh, 100,000 daily users, and now they have something like 158 million daily users, and that's five years later. So we've seen plenty of growth. What really captured our attention, though, was the engagement and the time that these kids were spending on it. Like I said, my daughter and her friends were, you know, going on the app 30 times a day, and, um, and they still do that today. So, you know, these kids live on this app, and uh, they spend a lot of time communicating with each other. 
So, Barry, the, the, the haters out there that say, look, this isn't going to be the next Facebook, you're saying it doesn't actually need to be, but it's the depth of, of addiction, really, to this particular app. Does it need to grow much past 158 million? Well, I don't know. I think every new social media platform uh, grows and develops its audience and its revenue in a, in a different way, and I think Snapchat is also taking its own course. I've got to dig into the rest of your portfolio because as 2017 goes, it's pretty stellar. You're in App Dynamics. I think I spoke to Jeremy yesterday who was saying you're in that for 10 years. They then suddenly get bought quickly by Cisco the day before they're meant to list. We then got MuleSoft, which is on, on the list to list itself and go public soon enough. Is this a perfect storm for companies to go public right now? Are you actually leaning on your portfolio companies to go public? No, I think, you know, we feel fortunate to have some of our companies have these liquidity events, and you mentioned, uh, you know, four of them, and uh, including Nutanix, and, and, and you know, um, but it wasn't like we made these investments yesterday. You know, we made uh, Nutanix and AppDynamics, uh, you know, eight and ten years ago. MuleSoft was about seven years ago, uh, and, of course, Snapchat five years ago. So these things take time. Uh, to build the business and really become mature enough companies to be able to stand alone as a public company. And we're thrilled that we have a number of these things happening uh, this year. It's been, a, it's been a nice year for us. Do you think it will continue? I mean, we're at heady heights when you look at the indices near record highs, if not at record highs. Had the market soured, would you have been as willing to see Snap go public right here, right now? I think it's, that's, a, that's an answer, a question for the company to make, but I think that you know, good companies, we've seen in the past, good companies can, can go public in, in bad markets. Um, and then, of course, in really good markets, a lot of companies can go public. I think what, what people are hoping is that, um, that Snapchat creates some excitement in the IPO market, and maybe some other companies can follow. We've got a great function on the Bloomberg called the Startup Barometer, and it really tracks not only the venture activity, but also the exits that we're seeing. It has deteriorated over the past few months, really, since the heady highs of December, and of course it was at its real highs back in June 2015. Does it need more exits to be feeding back into the seed money and the ecosystem in Silicon Valley and indeed around the world? Or do you think venture capitalism is becoming a little bit more wary of wanting to see growth and indeed some sort of measure of profitability before they come jumping in or is seed as good as it ever was? No, I, I think you're right. Um, as an industry, you know, everyone likes to talk about unicorns and these high, highly valued companies. But we have investors too. And they've been, they've been very patient with us. But they would like their money back and they would like more than their money back. And so liquidity is something that our industry has to deliver. Um, and I'm hoping that through 2017 and 18, our industry can start to deliver more liquidity back to our investors, which I think will fuel the continued growth of our industry. So do you think the ecosystem at the moment for startups is still awash with cash? Is still plenty of money wanting to get into the private companies? Are they allowed to stay private for longer? Or do you think that tide is changing? I think that tide is changing. I really do. I think, you know, there, there has been a lot of money come into our industry. Um, but at the end of the day, it's every company's dream to be a public company and stand on, on a loan. And, and I think a lot of companies want to do that. And so, you know, we're trying to encourage our companies to put themselves in position to be a candidate for that. And Barry, I've got to end on a, on a high note from what is a personal perspective, but a great feel-good story, because you also encouraged your children's school to invest in SNAP. And just explain who they were and how much money they've come out the wiser. Well, um, that's right. Uh, the St. Francis High School in Mountain View, where my kids were going at the time, uh, has a venture fund. Uh, it's sort of rare that they started in the late 90s, and I'm a member of. And uh, when we heard about SNAP through the kids at St. Francis High School, we thought, hey, what better way to you know, reward them and as to bring them along in our investment? So we asked them if they'd, they'd like to join us in the seed, and they said yes, and we recommended an investment. And, uh, the rest is history. They invested $15,000, and um, I think yesterday they sold some stock uh, somewhere around 23 or 24 million, and they still have some shares. So, uh, 
they're really happy at St. Francis, and I think they're going to do great things with that money. Wow. And from, two, what was it, eight million that you invested to some $2 billion holding you now have. Barry Eggers, absolutely wonderful news for you. Managing Director and Founding Partner of Lightspeed Venture Partners. I'm sure we'll be speaking to you in the future about some more portfolio companies. Now, a story we are watching. More questions over Uber. The company is drawing scrutiny for running a program to counteract government officials attempting to conduct sting operations. Now, the New York Times reports that the tool, known as Grable, allows the company to show enforcement officers a fake version of its application to make it more difficult for authorities to apprehend potentially law-breaking Uber drivers. But Uber said the effort is meant to enforce violations of its terms of service agreement and, well, it calls it a prevention program. The company's every move is under the microscope as scandals continue to pile up, including the surfacing of a video showing CEO Travis Kalanick arguing with a driver. And we'll have more on that video later this hour. Meanwhile, coming up, we catch up with the EU Competition Commissioner, Margaret Vestier. Find out what she has to say about the numerous US tech giants under the watchful eye of European regulators. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. A stock we're watching. GoPro shares falling about 6% on Friday. This after city analyst Stanley Kovler initiated coverage of the stock with a sell rating. Kovler described GoPro as the best house in a deteriorating neighborhood. He says GoPro's products aren't enough to overcome the overall decline in standalone imaging products. Well, Apple, Google and Amazon are just some of the US tech companies that have come under fire by European regulators. But EU Competition Commissioner Margaret Vestia says these campaigns have nothing to do with the company's country of origin and reiterated the need for a level playing field when doing business in Europe. And we say I caught up with the commissioner on Bloomberg Daybreak Americas and asked, well, if regulators are concerned by the pace of disruption in the tech industry. Well, no, I don't think so. Uh, it, I'm very happy uh, to be with you this morning. Uh, I think it's very important that we see businesses grow, create uh, value, uh, create jobs. Uh, and in Europe, of course, we are not at all foreign to success, uh, on the contrary. But obviously, we need to make sure that we have the right tools in the toolbox in order to, to, uh, to ensure fair competition. You've wielded those tools with some efficiency, it would seem. And I, I'm sitting in Silicon Valley at the moment. As a European, I still see myself and I hear these US companies at times feel that they are under fire. At times we've seen, of course, in the past year, Apple being asked to pay back billions. You've had Google being warned in terms of antitrust rule breachment. You've had Facebook being investigated regarding its deal with WhatsApp. Do you think US tech giants have something to concern from you? Do you think they're mis being misinterpreting perhaps what the EU is trying to accomplish? Well, one of our, our very, very basic values, uh, that's equal treatment. Uh, we don't see the flag, we don't see the ownership. Uh, in Europe, you also have big uh, publicly owned uh, businesses. Uh, what we are looking at is, of course, fair competition. And, uh, and we do want to see that also the successful companies, those who have grown big, that they allow for others to challenge them. Uh, and that is basically uh, sort of the content of, uh, of the now three uh, Google cases to allow to be challenged uh, and not to misuse a dominant position. And, and as you know, we are still in the process of, of looking into whether our, our objections uh, are correct, uh, taken on board, of course, also Google's views in, in that procedure. Talking of Google, the search case is now some seven years old. Does it frustrate you how long these investigations take? Is that just due process and we have to realize that things can take up to years? And do you have an idea of when the Google search case might be confirmed or indeed wrapped up? Well, I think that some of my uh, some of my staffers they find that I'm I'm a little obsessed uh, with speed, uh, but the thing is that no matter how much uh, we work on on making our processes more lean, well, we always help back by the fact that the quality of the casework that is what ensures the rule of law that you have the full right to defend yourself, and and that of course can never be compromised upon. So obviously we have to make sure that that we have sufficient time, but we're always pushing 
thing to make our procedures uh, quicker, more lean, to give better access to files, to make sure that we are working as, as professionally and as properly as at all uh, possible. That being said, it's very, very difficult to, to give any deadlines because something may come up and then of course we'll have to look into that and take that on board. That also goes for Google cases. Talking tax now, because it was, of course, what everyone's ears pricked up to when the Apple taxation rule came in place. That is being appealed. That was to do with Ireland, but there are other companies that you're looking at in a taxation form, that being, for example, Amazon, other countries like Luxembourg. How do these countries react to you? Do they worry about how efficient or attractive their tech hubs could be if the taxation rules are changed? Well, that is difficult uh, for me to say because we have a, a large degree of, of uh, autonomy in, in member states in Europe when it comes to setting the level of taxation. The one thing that we agreed upon, and that goes 60 years back uh, by now, is that taxpayers uh, shouldn't support uh, one company or a group of company where no one else can, can enjoy uh, these benefits. And that is basically the ups and downs of these tax cases, this very sort of old and fundamental principle that selective advantages uh, paid by taxpayers, well, that disturbs competition. Uh, and that's a competition tool that is specific uh, to Europe. Uh, I don't think that you have anything similar in, in the U.S. That was European Competition Commissioner Margaret Vestier, and we'll bring you more of that conversation later in the show. Coming up, we speak with Autodesk's interim co-CEOs on how the software company's faring after the departure of Carl Bass. That's next. And a reminder of our interactive TV function. You can find it at TV Go on the Bloomberg. You'll not only be able to watch us live, but also see previous interviews and dive into any of the securities or Bloomberg functions we talk about. And you can become part of the conversation by sending us instant messages during our shows. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only, I'm afraid, though. Check it out at TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Now, design software giant Autodesk's change of course is showing in its numbers. In the first earnings report since longtime CEO Carl Bass stepped aside, the design firm's transition to a subscription model boosted its recurring sales. But the company's overall revenue fell year on year, hindered by fewer upfront license and maintenance sales. Joining us now for more to deep dive on the company's road ahead from San Francisco, it's Autodesk interim co CEOs, Amar Hanspool, who also serves as the company's chief product officer, and Andrew Anagnost, who is also chief marketing officer. Gentlemen, thank you. And I first of all want to dig into the revenue because revenue per share loss guidance for the next year for full year 2018 did miss some forecasts. And I want to read you a quote from one of the analysts, Wedbush. She says, remain on the sidelines on the stock until the new subscription model can settle into a more consistent, predictable pattern. I want to ask you, Amar, first, when will this occur, this consistent pattern? Well, we're on the path to uh, delivering that. I mean, if you look at our annualized recurring revenue growth you know, it's growing very nicely and recurring revenue is now 84 percent of our quarterly revenue on track to get to 90 percent so you know we're building the right long-term results the change in the uh, outlook for 2018 really had to do with some decisions we made actually to change short-term revenue in uh, for long-term revenue so mm. you know they were as designed and I, you know we are very confident about our long-term targets this is, of course, something we've tracked with many a company making that shift to the cloud. You exactly. see it in Oracle, you see it in SAP. I want to ask you, Andrew, really, will you stop selling licenses altogether? How much will you shift to a cloud-based model? Can you break it down on a revenue sort of basis? Well, you know, essentially, we've already stopped selling perpetual licenses. We only sell a very small number of perpetual licenses. Mm -hmm. All of our mainline products have already done the cutover. I think the thing that's, that we're working on right now is moving the customers who are maintaining their perpetual licenses. It's another form of subscription we call maintenance. Yeah. They pay us a bunch of a fee every year and we ship them a new copy of perpetual software. That's the base that we have to now move over. So what we did in the earnings call is we announced our new program to move the maintenance base over to the pure subscription model as well. So that's going to be in process, and that will basically be the last vestiges of the perpetual model in our business. Right. Amar, does it therefore mean the three million we see in subscriptions is going to grow significantly? Yes, we anticipate it'll grow at uh, twenty percent uh, compound annual growth rate. So. I think we're seeing sustained momentum 
both from new customers uh, taking advantage of subscription and as Andrew mentioned, existing customers switching from maintenance over to subscription. So I think you know, we are on track to exceed over 5 million subscriptions in the, in the three year time frame. Andrew, talk to me about the new subscribers. Talk to me about the new sectors you as marketing chief are pushing into. Construction, manufacturing, that seems to be the way you're going. How much does it ebb and flow with where the economy is? Well, you know, obviously we do go a little bit with the economy, but the really cyclical part of our business is the low end of our business, the people that buy in small one to one or two person companies. That's where we see the most cyclical behavior. Other parts of our business in construction and manufacturing are actually really stable, and that's where we're seeing a lot of the growth, particularly in construction. One of the things you actually heard in our earnings report is we saw a three times growth in, or three times uh, more subscribers from our cloud products in Q4 than we saw in any other quarter. And those are the products that are squarely positioned on construction like BIM 360. Mm -hmm. We actually saw the same kind of performance in our manufacturing project products which are Fusion 360. We actually saw 150% growth year over year in the subscribers to those products. So we're seeing strong growth and really we're not seeing any secular or macro headwinds at all in our business. Talk to me, Amar, about the bottom line. We were hearing about the revenue potential, the subscription potential. What about the profitability? Is that going to start to pick up as and when? Absolutely. And so as our uh, annualized recurring revenue base keeps growing and more and more of the revenue becomes uh, recurring, you know, people can look and predict our, uh, our profitability, which we've you know, uh, tried to, through our investor day and other presentations, given an indication that we'll reach $6 in free cash flow per share by FY20. And you know the metrics that we delivered against it, the earnings show us uh, on track to to deliver that. So you know on a P&L basis on the traditional accounting side, you know, it looks like we're at, we're at a loss uh, right now. But you know everything is as designed and as uh, you know heading towards the profitability that we predicted uh, for the long term. Andrew, just how tough was the investor day? You've been under some pressure from activist investors in particular. How as a, a new interim co-CEO do you deal with that and what sort of pressure do they put on your business model? Well, you know, look, in the, the investor days are always an opportunity for us to explain what we're trying to accomplish long term. And one of the things we were getting from our investors, especially over the last 18 months, was we don't understand the transition. We don't understand where the business model is going and how you're doing it. So what we did is we spent a lot of time at our last investor day giving them detail about the business. And one of the things you saw was our stock price ran up pretty dramatically afterwards mm -hmm. because people started to get a little bit more detailed understanding about what we were doing and some of the underlying mechanics. And you know, that's what you have to do sometimes to get people comfortable with what's happening. You have to give them the details. Very quickly, gentlemen, Amar, to you. Are you going to remain CEO? Will Andrew be CEO? Will you be fighting it out? Can you be co-together? Oh, we are you know, working very well together. So you know, it's up to the board. They're running a process to figure out who the next leader will be. But you know, Andrew and I have worked together for 15 years or, or more. And you know, we're having a blast uh, running the company. Mm -hmm. We've been co-architects yeah. of this business model transition. And you know, we're going to keep driving it. It's wonderful to have you both on Autodesk Interim. Co-CEOs, Amar Hans-Paul and Andrew Anagnost. Thank you very much for joining me. Live from San Francisco, next up, we discuss Snap some more. This is Bloomberg. I'm Mark Crumpton. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's begin with a check of your first word news. President Trump visited a private religious school in Florida Friday, signaling that his education agenda will focus on school choice. He began the tour of St. Andrew Catholic School in Orlando with a visit to a fourth grade classroom. So you want your own business, and you're going to make a lot of money, right? But don't run for politics after you do it. <laughs> Teachers unions criticized the visit, saying it shows the president's hostility toward public schools. Mr. Trump called education, quote, the civil rights issue of our time and asked lawmakers to pass a bill that would fund school choice. In France, Emmanuel Macron has overtaken far-right candidate 
Marine Le Pen in the presidential race for the first time. A new poll has Macron with 27 percent, leading Le Pen by less than two points. Republican Party candidate Francois Fillon is under pressure to step aside after being caught up in a corruption investigation. Mexico's economy minister told the Detroit Economic Club Friday that any renegotiation of, renegotiation of NAFTA must be a win-win-win for Mexico, Canada and the United States. NAFTA is a 23-year-old agreement. We need to bring it up to modernity. When we were negotiating NAFTA, we didn't have cell phones. We have to do consultations with Mexico with fixed lines. E-commerce didn't exist. Mexico had not opened the energy sector. Now it's open and open for private investment and free competition. The telecom sector was not as important and relevant as it is today, and we have also open competition in the telecom sector in Mexico. Minister Guajardo says Mexico is part of the solution, not the problem. Tunisia agreed today to expedite acceptance of 1,500 citizens whose asylum applications were rejected by Germany. It also accepted a $264 million funding to develop rural regions and create jobs. The agreement between the Tunisians and Germany comes in the wake of a fatal track truck attack on a Berlin Christmas market carried out by a Tunisian. Anis Amri's asylum request was rejected, but Germany says Tunisia's bureaucratic delays prevented his expulsion. The U.N. Special Envoy for Syria, Stefan de Mistura, on Friday concluded a marathon round of talks in Geneva with an agreement from the conflicting parties to pursue further talks on a political transition to end the six-year war. The train is ready, it's in the station, it's got a warm, warming up its engine, everything is ready, it just needs an accelerator. And the accelerator is in the hands of those who were attending this round. Dimastura added only a political solution can address the problem. In New York, I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde. Let's get back to the biggest story in tech this week, the Snap IPO, of course. And the company looks to be off to a strong start after a pop in shares in its first few days of trading. I spoke with Bloomberg News reporter Alex Barinka and Bloomberg Technology startups reporter Eric Newcomer about Snap and some other key tech headlines grabbing our attention this week. People still excited, even with some of those long-term concerns, uh, looking at what some of the analysts are saying, the word euphoria or euphoric pop here comes to mind from some of the notes that we've read. But yes, still seems like a successful IPO so far. And we also have gotten some news on the likes of Comcast investing $500 million in the IPO itself. That's about a 15% stake of the shares that were sold. So big bet there for this media yeah. company getting into Snap. Great scoop. And also great Great reporting coming from you, Eric. Talk about euphoric. There are a few VCs out there who are euphoric right now. And it really is the making of Lightspeed Ventures in particular because they were the first ever investor in this company. Right, right. Lightspeed, you know, Jeremy Liu tracked him down with his uh, partner Barry Eggers and they, they found this, uh, you know, snap and got in and got a huge stake of it. It's worth more than two billion now. Now, of course, they're going to have to wait and see sort of they're in lockup for a while. So, you know, this price has to s sustain. They sold some of it in the IPO. I think it was 78 million, if I remember the number right. Benchmark is the biggest holder, but Lightspeed got in early. And of course, it's not just this snap investment. They've been in App Dynamics, Nutanix, MuleSoft. So it's just been a string of wins cap with this big consumer. And it, it's been interesting because there haven't been a lot of tech IPOs. So yeah. when you think about uh, uh, MuleSoft is on file right now. App Dynamics got bought by Cisco earlier this year, the day, the day before, before <laughs> it went public. Nutanix went yeah. public last year. And so when it comes to the lack of exits of the few that are out there, it does seem like Lightspeed's done it right. We don't know if it's them pushing their founders or just them picking the right founders, but Good, good outcomes here for Lightspeed. And, and they're playing the Silicon Valley game. They're getting in very early, which is what you need to yeah. do if you want to be one of these top firms, own a lot of the company by the time it goes public like Snapchat did. And it's a busier and busier space, the seed investing currently in the Silicon Valley. Let's flick our attention to a company that perhaps haven't had such a euphoric week. And an unbelievable scoop from you, Eric. Coming from Uber, you managed to get your hands on a very special video. 
Right. This is, you know, a driver, you know, every driver I think has imagined this at some point confronting, you know, sort of their top boss, the CEO of Uber, Travis Kalanick, in a car, you know, after, you know, a sort of eight minute long ride. At the end of the ride, the driver speaks up and said, I'm going bankrupt because of you, and directly confronts Travis, who has sort of a fierce response. I mean, to be fair, it was the, what, the Super Bowl night, maybe Kalanick had had a little bit of a drink or two and wasn't being fully himself, but what he has done is come out and apologized. He has, and there's been a lot of questions around his leadership abilities yeah. because of this. If this is how you interact with your employees, he's already dealing with um, the sexual harassment claims in the past couple of weeks from a former employee, so there's a lot of concerns going on right now, and frankly, I've been, uh, you know, up to my eyeballs with IPO folks <laughs> this week week and talking to them about Uber it seems like you know this was a name that folks would consider might be of the size that could go these are some of the paramount concerns that could keep a company from getting out regardless of, of the company's plans right now they they say they're gonna wait uh, Travis has always said he's gonna wait but when it comes to a uh, future path if they ever decide to go especially in the near term these kind of risks are gonna be kind of layered on top of all the regulatory concerns and and those kind of things that we've seen in the past. I mean, we heard Peter Thiel, who of course isn't in Uber, but he has once upon a time called this the most ethically challenged company in Silicon Valley. Yeah, and I mean, Travis is finally, he said, you know, admitted for the first time that he needs leadership help. So there are lots of questions about whether whether that just means an advisor, whether that means some very strong sort of Sheryl Sandberg S C O O, or that, whether that means like an Eric Schmidt style sort of steward CEO. We really don't know what's going to happen, what he means by leadership help. But it's clear that they have to make moves and bring some people in. They have you know an acting CFO right now. There are a lot of high level positions that they still need to fill. That, of course, was Bloomberg's Alex Berinka and Eric Newcomer and still with Uber, and yet another executive has stepped down. Ed Baker, vice president of product and growth, announced his departure in an email to his team. Now, that's according to Recode. He is the second executive to resign from the ride-hailing company in the last week. VP of engineering Amit Singhal quit after reports of his failure to disclose that he was the subject of a sexual harassment investigation at his previous employer, Google. Now, meanwhile, all the share-popping love for Snap is sure to draw out the sceptics. That's the thought of S3 Partners, a financial analytics firm, which says, well, short interest in the photo app maker is liable to reach $1 billion within a week. This based on how bearish bets evolved in other recent IPOs. Joining us now to discuss the ins and outs of Snap is Bloomberg editor-at-large Corey Johnson from San Francisco. Corey, you buy the short interest building. I'm looking at the analyst recommendations. We've now got five on the Bloomberg, and there, none of them are a buyers yet. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think that the uh, the analyst recommendations, frankly, aren't those that are there now don't matter a whole lot. I mean, there are 26 investment banks on this deal, so they have 26 investment banks that will likely, many of them, write research about Snapchat, uh, but they are prohibited from doing so for 40 days after the IPO. So you won't see the bulk of the research until then. And and uh, a Chinese wall or not, I would expect they will come with some bullish arguments for the stock. But potentially, there are not only bullish hopes for where the share price goes if you happen to be a VC company that's right. locked up in the shares or indeed someone who's working at Snap, but when you pour over the IPO prospectus of you as you have, there are some, some weeds to be pulling out, it seems. Yeah, and, and, I, and I don't mean to suggest that you, you're short a stock because the company has problems or you're short a stock because of valuation. I mean, this valuation, you know, frankly, doesn't make any sense based on the existing business. So people who like this stock at 20 times sales might love the stock at 30 times sales. It doesn't mean it's <laughs> going to go down because it's expensive. But I think it's important to understand the underlying characteristics of how the business works. And fundamentally, it's about how many users they have and how fast they can grow that user base while they charge more and more to advertisers to reach those users. Does it? I was just speaking to Barry Egger, or who of course was the man who first found Snapchat via his daughter, put the money in with Lightspeed Ventures via his colleague Jeremy Liu, and he's saying, look, it's the addiction that matters. It's not the 158 million. Of course, there might be some expansion in developed world, but it seems to be the fact that they've got such addiction and that really bespoke area of youth culture, which is Gen X. Oh, look, I mean, I, it's, it's a wonderful product and it's beloved by its users and they spend tons of time on it. It doesn't mean the business can make any money, but it also doesn't mean the business can grow. For this business to grow, it's mm -hmm. going to have to add a lot more users. And user growth, as we've been talking about for the last two day, couple of days, uh, user growth has been slowing down and slowing down dramatically when a similar experience, yeah. Instagram stories, uh, appeared on the map. 
But I think what's really interesting here isn't just that it's the slowing growth around uh, into, the, into the fourth quarter, that 3% growth number that was so disconcerting. I, I think the real question is, you know, what was the holiday seasonality? The company, in some commentary in the, in the S1 filing, said that they actually had a, a boost uh, in, in user growth at the end of the fourth quarter because of the holidays. So if, if that 3% number is, is a, is a steroid-induced, holiday-induced uh, boost, uh, that's really worrisome for the next quarter. So there's this line in the S1. So I want you to pay attention to this. Okay, so not that you don't pay attention all the time, Caroline. <laughs> but seasonal growth typically carries the, from the fourth quarter to the early part of the first quarter, meaning that we expect the rate of net additional daily active users to be impacted by short-term holiday seasonality. There it is, holiday seasonality which we do not expect to continue through future months. So it sounds like they're saying the boost of holiday seasonality, the addition of users that we saw uh, at the end of the fourth quarter might continue for a few weeks in January, but didn't continue beyond that. If the user growth is well below even 3% in the first quarter, and maybe worse in the second quarter, that's a big problem for this valuation in this stock. Corey, are you going to be a Snapchat parent? Are you someone who is getting into using Snapchat yourself? Do you buy any of the view that it will expand in terms of the age group? I'm not sure if you just called me really old or even older. Um, well, so because you procreated doesn't mean you're old, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, uh, I think Snapchat's great. Um, I, I, there's a hilarious New Yorker cartoon that shows a head exploding. And it says there's another case of an, of an, uh, an adult trying to figure out how to use Snapchat. <laughs> um, I think Snapchat's a, a wonderful service and hilarious and has a certain uh, great place uh, for communication, regardless of the age of the user. Um, I don't think it will be uh, uh, that, that uh, grown ups will not use it. I also think that young people will continue to use it. But uh, that's, you know, expanding the user base is, is so important because when users use this product, they yeah. use it a lot. Yeah, and that's a question of international growth and indeed yeah, how they'll start to build the advertising. We always trust you, Corey, to pick through the and get the juice when it comes to these sorts of prospectuses and Getting S1s. The juice, yes. Thank you very much indeed, as ever, for getting it out for us. That, of course, was our editor at large, Corey Johnson. Coming up, well, more of my conversation with European Competition Commissioner Margaret Vestia. What she has to say about all three, yes, three Google investigations. Next, this is Bloomberg. U.S. social media giants are currently facing antitrust privacy probes in Europe over data collection. In part two of our exclusive interview with European Competition Commissioner Margaret Vestia, I asked, well, at what point do companies garner the attention of antitrust regulators? Well, we, we are actually, you know, looking more and more careful because we see that personal data and, and, and big data when, when, when you have a lot of personal information can be an, uh, a barrier to entry for other companies. Uh, it can be a very, very strong asset when it comes to, to innovation. Uh, so far, we haven't had cases where it was data issues that sort of really was the make or break uh, in any trans trans transaction. Uh, but we are looking for it because we see that it becomes a more and more important asset in, in a number of different sectors, actually. Yeah, certainly we're looking at Germany for a case in point. They are analyzing whether Facebook perhaps has looked at signing, forcing its users to sign unfair privacy agreements. Is this something that you might be looking at from an EU-wide level? Well, actually, we have asked the Germans to, to look into these issues, both with a German legislative perspective, but also with a European uh, perspective, in order to make sure that, that we work efficiently and, and divide labor when, whenever uh, due. And this is a very interesting probe, uh, because they, they are looking at the interface between uh, privacy and competition law to see if, if the fact that Facebook is very dominant in, in some markets have allowed them uh, has allowed them actually to to make uh, uh, their users accept uh, less protection of uh, of their personal information that they would otherwise have uh, due to the legislation. Digging into Facebook a little bit more, of course, you've been looking at the WhatsApp deal signed back in 2014. Has the company responded to potentially some of your objections regarding the data that they provided and, and the viewpoints they put forward during the transaction? 
Well, while we're still in the, in the middle of that uh, sort of process uh, investigation, so it is too early to say, but we put a lot of efforts into this because it, obviously it's very, very important for us to have correct information uh, because we base our investigations of the fact of the case, the evidence, uh, the information that we get from the companies when we do a merger control. And therefore, obviously, for us it's very, very important if we find out uh, or get a concern that we weren't given the right uh, set of, uh, of evidence and, and facts uh, when we did the murder control. And therefore, of course, uh, for us, this is high priority uh, and we try to, to do it as, as quickly as possible. And you're hoping this sends a sign out to those companies that are looking at doing deals that transparency is the key? Well, transparency with us is the key because obviously we are very, very committed uh, to protect uh, also the confidentiality in these transactions. We, we put a lot of effort into making sure that there is no leakages, that you can actually have a, a trusting working relationship, even though we may have uh, different responsibilities in the process of merger control. Uh, but it is very important for us to have correct data, uh, full information in order for us to work in a way that will actually uh, also make things happen uh, in a constructive way, making sure that we can do our job uh, in a speedily and qualified way. When looking at another key tech giant, of course, Google is Alphabet owned. Google is something that you, of course, delve into on, on various types of issues. There's some two Google cases out there at the moment, particularly regarding Android phone software and advertising. These are contract based. Does that ever affect whether you incline to settle with a company or indeed impose fines? Where do you stand on the two outcomes? Well, the, the two cases, the uh, AdSense case and the Android case, they are they are newer uh, than the Google search case. Uh, we they, Google have received statement of objections in both cases. We have their answers, but we're still in the process of analyzing those answers, and, and therefore, basically, uh, it is open as to where those two cases uh, will go at the moment. Are U.S. companies in general, the big tech giants that you speak to, generally very free forthcoming with help and, and responsiveness to the EU Competition Commission? Uh, yes, in, in general, uh, I think so. Uh, of course, uh, we have uh, different responsibilities, uh, the businesses to their owners and shareholders, us uh, to the, the citizens to enjoy the, the fruits of, of fair competition, of innovation, quality, uh, affordable prices. But I think there is, a, there is a respect of the different responsibilities and, and very often a, a constructive uh, working relationship. Sometimes it seems as though companies in against, for example, Google concerned about photos, concerned agencies there, particular publishers. It seems to go from maybe uh, not always in the realms of antitrust, but they seem to be looking to the antitrust commissioners to help with their plight, whether it's actually something more to do with contract overwriting. What, what, what do you believe about the antitrust issue here? Is it an antitrust issue when it's perhaps more about copyright? Well, well, we of course have to be very thorough before we open a case because copyright is copyright and antitrust and antitrust. And, and even though the, the, the competence uh, uh, and the forces to, to enforce competition law is very strong in Europe, that doesn't mean that every question becomes a, a question of uh, competition law enforcement. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, of course, we uh, try to be very precise in making sure that we do not use our antitrust tools uh, when it's a copyright issue or when it's an issue of, of how contract has been made uh, and that of course we also try to be be very open with people who come with, uh, to us uh, and have uh, concerns or want to complain to say well well something we can look into and other things well they are for other authorities oh how is Europe when it comes to the companies the governments when they come to you with complaints about some of the United States tech giants do you feel sometimes they were over protectionist or usually the viewpoints valid well, of course, it, it, it takes uh, some um, 
uh, some solidity in, in a complaint for us to start investigating uh, because we need something to go on uh, before we, we go there. But the thing is, and, and you probably know that, that uh, some of the complainants in the first Google case, well, they are U.S. companies, yes. uh, but also active in, in the European market. Uh, so I, I don't see that the, that the flag or the nationality of the company uh, plays a role. It's, it's the behavior in the marketplace that makes people concerned and that sometimes uh, triggers a, a complaint. That was European Competition Commissioner Margaret Vestia there. And Monday on Bloomberg Television, the surveillance team will be speaking with Howard Davies, his Royal Bank of Scotland non-executive chairman, about the political risks out of Europe. That conversation begins 5 a.m. in New York, 10 a.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. In today's revolving door, TechCrunch is reporting that President Trump's administration has tapped Michael Kratzius as Deputy Chief Technology Officer. He previously served as Chief of Staff at Teal Capital. Peter Teal is a supporter and advisor to the President. Pandora has extended its deadline for investors to propose any changes to its board of directors. You may remember the struggling internet radio company has been weighing a sale since last year. Activist investors can use annual meetings to try and oust board members or challenge executive salaries. The looming deadline will pressure stockholders to make any proposed reforms public by March 17th. And Amazon is planning to expand its Echo offerings. According to a report by Recode, the company is expected to unveil a device that will allow people to initiate phone calls by voice. This product or products will also allow people to talk with others on the opposite end of another Alexa device, very similar to an intercom system. And finally, shares of Nutanix tumbled 26% in the session. The cloud services company was downgraded by Morgan Stanley to underweight, saying sales, execution issues and rising component costs will hurt the company for several quarters. Nutanix went public last September. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology and live from New York. We're back in San Francisco next week and we have an exclusive interview with Fei Fei Li, the lead of Google's cloud machine learning group. She's also director of Stanford's Artificial Intelligence Lab and Vision Lab More. This, her first interview since joining Google. That's all for now. Live from New York, this is Bloomberg. <laughs>